Good morning and welcome to the 15th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Um, could everybody make sure their electronic devices are switched off, or at least turned to silent mode so it doesn't interfere with the committee. Um, item one today is the committee taking evidence on the National Fraud Initiative. Um, the National Fraud Initiative is a biennial counter-fraud exercise that runs across the UK. The exercise helps to identify fraud and error in the public sector by comparing data submitted by different public bodies and flagging up data matches which suggest error or fraud has taken place. Um, the exercise is overseen by the Cabinet Office with exercises in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland run by each jurisdiction's respective audit office. Um, our committee's interest arose from an evidence session with Audit Scotland on the most recent National Fraud Initiative exercise in Scotland. And as part of our new post-legislative scrutiny role, um, we decided to examine whether there were any ways um, that the legislation underpinning the operation of the NFI could be improved to help secure even better outcomes. Um, we will have two panels today. The first consists of representatives from local authorities who responded to our call for evidence. So I very much welcome um, Brian Muldoon, who's the Corporate Investigation Team Manager at Aberdeen City Council, Elaine Greaves, who's the Internal Audit Manager, and Heather Mohadeen, Senior Auditor at Midlothian Council, Athel Scott, Internal Audit Manager at Murray Council, Yvonne Douglas, Audit and Compliance Manager, and Cecilia McGee, Audit Advisor, both from South Lanarkshire Council. Welcome to you all. Now, it's a large panel. Um, you know, we you don't all need to feel the, the need to answer, but I will let my colleagues direct the questioning. Um, let me kick off today's session um, by asking each council to state whether you feel the act underpinning the National Fraud Initiative is clear about which bodies should take part, how they should do so, and whether participation is compulsory. Let me start off with Brian Muldoon, because he's not looking at me, so <laughs> okay. he gets to go first. We certainly, we've been involved in the National Fraud Initiative since, or, um, since um, it started, and we do believe that it is, uh, um, it's very important to tackle the area of um, fraud within um, public authorities. Um, obviously, we have put our submission um, forward, um, which we listed down um, what our areas that we feel that we could sort of um, strengthen in relation to national fraud um, legislation. Sorry. It's okay. It, it, I was looking at more clarity about which bodies should take part in terms of the legislation, um, how they should do so, and, and whether participation is compulsory, because there seemed to be a slight difference of opinion um, between the local authorities as to who was covered, who was in, in the scope of the legislation. Well, I certainly believe that all public bodies should actually um, contribute to it. After all, it is public money. Um, I certainly know from um, that there seemed to be some issues with was it universities um, providing um, Audit Scotland with um, with <laughs> data. It's important that everybody works together um, in relation to this. Um, so I don't. I think that where public money is being spent, whether it's directly by a local authority or a government department or whether we um, involve private industries. Um, I, I, there's an example I gave in here that Aberdeen City Council um, have put out the tender and we're, we have a private contractor who's building the new Aberdeen Exhibition Centre. So because that's public money, it was our view that we should be able to extract data from that company um, as well. So, but in order to do that, obviously, legislation would need to be um, would need to be strengthened. Thank you very much. I don't know whether Elaine or Heather want to take this one on. I suppose I'm asking is uh, principally about existing legislation and its coverage, rather than just an, an extension. The first point, participation being compulsory, I think that's how important that it is, um, <clears throat> because the more organisations that take part, the the value of doing so, I think, is increased. Um, I think other bodies that should be that should be um, involved are things like HMRC. Cause I think there's a lot of data there that could be used, um, and I also think that the awareness of the, the exercise, the NFI exercise, should be increased um, among the general public, just to, to show this is the sort of thing we're doing to try and act as a preventative measure. Um, and I think um, 
legislation-wise, I think um, one of the things we feel is quite important is that in England is the Prevention of Social Housing Fraud Act 2013, and we don't seem to have anything in Scotland. So when you're actually investigating the matches, um, having the legislation to, to do something about it, because we've recovered quite a lot of council houses in Midlothian, and the onus is getting the, the house back. Um, rather than taking any prose prosecution, you know, taking any legal action, because you don't really have the legislation to do so. So I think f moving forward, I think it would be quite good if that legislation could be strengthened to, to help with doing the actual matches. Okay. Thank you very much. Heather, do you have anything to add? No, I don't have anything to add. Okay. Mr Scott. Thank you, convener. Uh, essentially, from a Murray Council perspective, uh, uh, I, 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 I believe that the NFI... It uh, should be compulsory. I think that we've been uh, dealing with this for a number of rounds now, and I think certainly all local authorities participate uh, under the review by uh, Audit Scotland. Uh, I don't have a strong view in terms of uh, other bodies that, that could participate. I think uh, other bodies have been added recently, and uh, that has maybe assisted in getting the scope and coverage of potential matches and has maybe uh, improve the range of matches that are available. Uh, but of course, in, in that context, it does mean that uh, we're being provided with an increasing number of matches at each round, and uh, uh, these have to be validated, and uh, there's a resource implication to that. So I'm quite keen to see uh, additional bodies participate, uh, provided uh, it doesn't result in us being swamp with too much information because the uh, meantime uh, an awful lot of the matches that are returned to us are actually valid you know the matches the match is okay uh, there's nothing nothing to be concerned about in relation to the match so there's a lot of sort of false positives in there that need to be considered thank you very much yvonne douglas um, I think I'd support much of uh, what my colleagues have, have already said. Um, we make extensive use of the NFI exercise um, and we welcome as many public bodies participating in that as possible because it increases the data sets and therefore the matches that come to us. What we can then do as a local authority is risk assess those matches when they come back to us and prioritise them. So um, I do accept that we would maybe increase the matches that we would get if we included more public bodies. Um, but what we would then do is apply our own local um, risk assessment to it, to what ones that we would consider prioritising in terms of investigation. Um, because as the point has been made with uh, constraints on our resources, that's something that w we need to consider at the point the matches are returned to us. Uh, I think we had pulled out um, HMRC as being a particular body that we would be interested in in matching um, because we feel that we would pull out possible conflicts of interest and that's something um, that we've been particularly interested in over the last couple of years, particularly in relation to our procurement arrangements, um, trying to strengthen our internal arrangements in relation to that, but we would obviously welcome the opportunity to be able to match against HMRC data because it would give us something else to allow us to independently check what our own employees are already <coughs> declaring to us. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will turn to questions from members, and I think Colin Beesey was first. Thank you, Vera. Um, I was quite interested, actually, in the submission from Audit Scotland. For the, for the first time, I've seen reference to real-time pre-transaction checking, and I didn't even know that existed. Uh, it does say there's a, there's a cost for this, but would you see a use for that? Are you aware of that facility? And have you considered it and rejected it for cost reasons? Have you considered whether there's advantages in doing real-time checking? I'll take that one. Um, yeah, certainly we're, we're aware of um, the facility that um, is on the, the website um, to allow us to do it. There's certainly an argument to be made that if you can do checks at the very beginning of a claim, um, you can perhaps rule out some elements um, of fraud. The cost implication is, I have actually put this in, in my report as well, because there is a cost associated with that, um, us in Aberdeen Council have not taken on board um, that. It's very much left to individual service managers to decide if they have the budget that they want to take, or sorry, 
if they want to sort of do that proactive approach um, to claims. I didn't print, bring the, the print out with me. Um, I think it's about £300, I think, for the check, I think. I think I've got it could, it's, on a, it's on a scale. Yeah. The, the more that you do, um, it works out sort of better, better value. But I just I can't remember the cost just now. So, as, sorry, sorry. Sorry, please go on. So I was just going to say, as Atho says, it does... We already have deadlines in the council to produce um, or to put benefits in payment or to produce services on time. And if we are going to start doing um, additional checks at the very beginning, yes, it can perhaps reduce the risk of fraud, but it does have a knock-on effect that it does slow the system down. So things like that would have to be addressed. Do any others have a view on it? From my perspective, I mean, what you're talking about there is probably preventative measures. And I think it's quite interesting that the people from the councils are auditors uh, who tend to, or generally auditors, who tend to review things after the fact. And I think that the NFI population uh, that we, we look at uh, is almost a retrospective position. So things have happened. People have claimed entitlement to benefits. People have been paid public funds on the payroll or through the creditor system or whatever, eh, all of that information is matched and it comes to us retrospectively. Then, as, as my colleague says, having risk assessed the data, we then do the checks. I think that the point that you were referring to is almost for the service departments in terms of it's another potential check when somebody seeks to access a service or seek delivery of a service. So there's almost the the, the, the pre-checks, if you like, which that would form part of, uh, and the, the, the follow-up checks that, that we would do when the data is published every two years. Okay, I was just interested because I hadn't seen reference to the real-time checking before. Given um, the scope of NFI, we've talked about the possibility that other public bodies could be in included in that. It seems to me that there would be a huge benefit in having the housing associations and alios included in, in this. How, how would you view that? What would the implications be if that happened? <coughs> the end result would just be that we would have, have more matches. I mean, the matches run into the thousands. Um, and, and what we're trying um, to do is make sure that they're good matches. Um, which means they match across a number of fields, which means that it's a, an area that's worth investigation. Um, so I, I don't think we would have any resistance to including more bodies. I think the resulting effect for us would be that we would be presented with an awful lot more uh, data matches for us um, to look at. And of course, we would need to develop our procedures for risk assessing because as you add in different bodies, the, the risks attached to that are different. So there would be a bit of a learning curve uh, for local authorities to make sure that we were adapting our processes um, to continue to take that risk-based approach that we've always taken. If, for example, housing associations were included, what would the cost implications be in terms of resources or whatever for yourself? Uh, for us in uh, South Lanarkshire, we're, we're the facilitators, so we don't actually do the investigation. So we coordinate the upload of data um, to Audit Scotland, and then we facilitate when the matches come in to make sure that that information is passed on to council resources, and we then monitor how they're uh, proceeding with uh, the individual investigations. So, so for us, it wouldn't have a particular impact as an audit function, but obviously for all these things, there's a time cost attached to it, and I suppose that would be um, where housing associations would, would um, argue that the, there was a cost to them, because it would involve people's time in uploading the data and obviously bringing in new organisations as well. It would be a new process for them, so probably um, not as efficient as it now is within local authorities, because we've worked with it for a number of years. Still looking at uh, the implications of uh, of uh, the matching process, would it improve things at all if there was mandatory uh, follow-ups of matches? Because at the moment there isn't. Uh, I, I would say definitely not. I mean, I think that in my submission I kind of indicated that I think it's uh, absolutely essential that, that public bodies. Uh, participate in the process. So I think that uh, 
uh, the requirement that's currently on us to provide data uh, for the matching process is, is vital. But uh, as I indicated in my, my introductory piece, uh, there's an awful lot of matches that can be quickly dispensed with. You know, so you, you look at a match and you can very quickly say uh, that there's no issue surrounding that. And, and I think that, uh, as we talked about, in terms of uh, each organisation risk assessing what is important and what is less important, uh, we do have an external audit process within local government such that uh, our appointed auditors take an interest in what we're doing. So these auditors uh, are looking for us to take a proportionate approach. Uh, if, we, if we didn't follow up any matches, then I think that would be commented upon in the review of the council's say, accounts. So I think it's, it's, it's important that that part of the exercise is left to the individual body to determine what the priorities are, what should be followed up, what should not be followed up, and make that justification locally to their external auditor. So you wouldn't favour mandatory follow-ups? I wouldn't favour mandatory follow-ups of all matches. Does anyone disagree with that? Any I disagree. I actually echo what um, Athol is saying. I don't think that putting a specific deadline would be... I don't see where we would benefit from it. Um, the vol We have to remember that the volume of matches that come in um, is can be an issue. Um, for example, the matches come in in January um, and it takes many, many months for us to actually process the matches, whether they're false positives or whether there is actually an indication um, of fraud there. In Aberdeen, we have um, a dedicated um, investigation team. Um, however, it does take us over a year still to go through all the matches. Um, so by putting an actual deadline on it, would impact on other duties that the investigators have got as well. Doesn't a year seem an extraordinary time? I agree, it, it does. However, it's just it's the simple volume um, of work that's um, that's associated with the, the National Fraud Initiative. While we have a lot of referrals coming in, but we also have referrals coming in from um, staff, from members of the public, from management as well. So. The investigators, speaking for Aberdeen, the investigative team is very busy. So while we do try to prioritise the National Fraud Initiative, um, it does come at a cost of some of our other, some of our other inquiries. What what sort of period uh, do other councils take to complete the matching process, or at least to complete the investigations? We've got a, a dedicated. Um, uh, corporate fraud team. We have two, two officers um, and we're in a similar position where we have all the day-to-day -day work that we normally do and we're, we're doing the um, NFI exercise on top of that and our senior auditor is the lead contact for Midlothian and, and does all the updating on the, the website and things. So it is very resource intensive but I think one of the kind of concerns we have is a lot of the matches now go to DW, DWP to investigate and so we are reliant on them doing the, the investigations and, and achieving the outcomes and I think from the point of view I, I mean I agree probably making it man, mandatory is, is probably don't agree with that but then if you are relying on other organisations to do their bit and they don't because they've got thousands of matches to do as well then it's difficult for us to, on the back of that, to take action, say, for the council tax reduction scheme, be reliant on DWP investigating for the, the housing benefit side. Um, and that's for not just for NFI, that's for other cases that we have. So, uh, I mean, there's swings and, swings and roundabouts a wee bit from that point of view, but, I mean, it, it is resource intensive. And I think it's quite good to have that um, ability to say, we've checked so many matches, it's risk-based, you know, we're not getting anything from this, let's, let's draw a line under it and move on to something else where it might be a bit more fruitful. Um, what sort of time scale are you looking at to complete the investigations? The investigations, um, in the main, um, the matches are distributed to the various services, housing um, and other areas in the council. And these, um, the officers in the various services do it within, in a, along with their current work, checking the matches to see if it's a data issue or if there is genuinely a potential for fraud in there. Um, so 
I have um, distributed all the matches to the people. Uh, they are sort of in the progress of checking at the moment, and I will be following up with them later in the year. By September, I expect all of the matches to have been um, gone through, checked, any uh, potential frauds to be identified. And, and when were the matches actually created? They, they were released. The, infra the data was uploaded uh, based on uh, at the beginning of October, and the matches were released in January with subsequent matches have been continued to be released up to May. So the whole process again is virtually a year? Yes. Is that the same for everybody? Yes. Um, we pass the matches out to resources to individual departments to investigate and we ask them to set targets of numbers and um, time scales. We aim for the majority of them to have them all finished by September. Um, the exception to that is the housing benefit and that's really because of the volume and also with the process of the interaction with DWP we have to send information to DWP to get it back so there is quite a delay there um, before we can confirm whether it's a fraud or an error so with the exception of housing benefit I would say we aim to have um, all the other matches finished by September um, and I, I think we ask the, the departments to make their to set their own targets. Um, basically, we take into account the other controls that they have in place. So they do have other processes where they are checking for fraud, and particularly in housing benefit, where they are doing their own reviews. So um, I would say to make it mandatory would take away the, the flexibility with being able to and build um, continuous <coughs> controls in, in departments where they are looking for fraud on a daily basis. Um, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I'm actually just going to ask you to track back one stage, uh, because it, it's all rather complex. The, the initiative seems rather complex, and Elaine Greaves made a, an important point earlier on that there's an awful lot of public awareness needs to be built into this uh, if there's to be a deterrent effect. Um, <clears throat> and Colin Beatty then just talked about the process taking year. So, just at the outset, would one of you mind just setting out what that process is, uh, as you see it, from beginning to end, just very briefly, how does the initiative stack up? Mr Scott. Okay, I'll have a go. I mean, essentially, uh, uh, there's a whole range of data sets that are uh, uh, provided in a specification that comes from the Cabinet Office. So, uh, in, around October each year, uh, we have to make arrangements within the Council for each of these data sets to be uploaded uh, to the secure database that the Cabinet Office uh, uh, operates. So it's a bit of work to be done September-October time in relation to that process. Uh, we then wait for the matches to be returned, which is, is typically at the end of January. When you say matches? Yeah. <coughs> well, matches, these, these can either be internal to the authority so, for example, uh, in relation to payroll matches, uh, uh, well, no, they can be internal to the authority, so uh, you may have two payments for a similar amount mm -hmm. uh, to the same contractor. Uh, so they will appear as a match. Uh, or you can have two different bodies involved. So you can have maybe somebody who's on, on Murray Council payroll and they're also on Highland Council payroll. Uh, so that would be a match. Uh, so there's, there's different matches appear within each of the criteria. In Murray Council's case, end of January, we got back in the last cycle about 2,800 matches. Uh, they were spread across all of the different match groups, uh, be it housing benefits, student loans, payroll, uh, creditor payments, uh, housing waiting lists, etc. What I essentially do then, at the end of January, beginning of February, is carry out some kind of overview. You know, have a look at the matches, what are the volumes, uh, what are the potential issues, issues that has been mentioned already, issues that relate to housing benefit or the council tax reduction scheme. They tend to be passed over to uh, the uh, single corporate fraud investigator that we have in the council 
uh, because uh, she has a background in benefits and council tax. So she gets these. The remainder are reviewed by me in terms of do I think they're appropriate. I gave you a couple of examples. Uh, you can quite easily have an employee, for example, a supply teacher who does two days in Highland Council, three days in Murray Council. That's not, an, it appears as a match, but it's not an issue. So you can quickly discount that. Similarly, if you look at the credit or payments, you may have a, a, a contract with a school, <coughs> a school bus provider. So they charge the same rate per day. So if you get uh, 20 days at £100 in March, 20 days at £100 in May, the invoice value will be the same, but it's not an issue. So I do an overview across all the sections, determine uh, which uh, matches should be looked at. Uh, within the process, uh, uh, there are recommended matches that come forward from the Cabinet Office, and of my 2,800, about 700 are recommended. But as I've indicated already, some of these I review, some of them I don't, depending on the risk assessment. So the, the information will be passed out potentially to uh, the fraud person that I mentioned, uh, somebody, a housing officer, somebody who works in community care, who deals with blue badges and residential care, uh, and the, one of my auditors. Now, they won't work on this constantly. You know, there's other demands on their time, as already been said. Uh, but essentially, I will look to these people over the period, February, March, April, uh, to pursue some of them, to, to review some of the matches in more detail. Uh, the ones that I have indicated as, as higher risk. And then in this most recent period, they're starting to feed back information in terms of investigations that are complete. Or, as has also been mentioned, if there's another party involved, we will send away a request, which is feasible within the system. We will send away a request to the third party to say, uh, can you confirm your side of the information so that we can then determine what further action might need to be taken. So that is over the sort of period uh, in the spring, if you like. So at this point in time, the work that started in October is not fully completed, but what ordinarily happens is that, that uh, our external orders have a sort of progress update usually around the 30th of June. So, you know, in terms of my programme, I kind of think, you know, five months after the, the matches have been issued, we should at least have a position statement for the, the, the council and the external auditor to say, <coughs> this, is, this is what we've done with our 2,800 matches. And some of them, some of them will fall off the end of the table in terms of no further action because uh, they've been deemed by me to be low risk. So that kind of gives a, an overview. I don't know if that's what you were looking for. But. That's extremely useful. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll move from there to uh, Mr Muldoon in, in your submission. You talk about data being uploaded to the NFI website in September, October, but the results not being available until January. Uh, and you say that the results at that point are now out of date. What do you mean by out of date? Does that mean they're unusable? Some of them will be unusable because if, take for example, if we submitted data on the 1st of September, for example, and the person's circumstances who the data relates to changed, or say two days later, the NFI is not capturing that information, but the council system is. So what then happens is in the January, when we get the data matches that have all been submitted, for example, that were done on the 1st of September, we have already <coughs> dealt with the, the customer who came in to tell us about a change of circumstances on the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, whatever, of September. So what that then means is that we are then having to recheck that data when the National Fraud Initiative data comes in in January. So it's, it's part of what my colleagues are saying. It's all about assessing the risk. But some of that risk has already been negated. And it's simply because of the delay between us submitting data and actually getting the matches back. And that can be a bit problematic because that costs us a lot of administrative um, time. 
one of the solutions that I think that I don't know if I could say this. One of the solutions to that is possibly not having the NFI done every two years if we were able to sort of put a process in place where the matches were done six monthly or, for example, quarterly, then we would sort of potentially catch that and not spend as much time simply doing administrative work. Um, but hopefully that's what you see. Mm -hmm. uh, so what proportion? So uh, Mr Scott talked about 2,800 potential issues uh, or, or matches coming in. So what proportion uh, across all of you of those matches are ultimately found to be fraudulent? Yeah. Um, the certainly measurable outcomes mm -hmm. for the matches that we receive are very, very low. I mean, it's, it, I couldn't declare it as a percentage. Um, it's we may have ten. We've we received four, four and a half thousand matches this year, mm -hmm. and um, I expect we may have. It'll be a good um, return if we have twenty positive outcomes. And is that? Could the rest of you answer that actually? Because that's quite significant, isn't it? A lot. A lot of it really depends on the sort of the data match. There's so many data matches. So, mm -hmm. for example, you could have matches, as Ethel was saying about. Um, care homes, so we have where somebody who is in a care home, um, the resident may have passed away, but the care home continued to send invoices into the council, whereas we've learned that the person has deceased through um, other, or through data matches or through um, other avenues. Um, their errors will appear on that. So that then means we can go back to, for example, the care home and say, right, well, you've been overbilling us um, and so we want the money back. You then have other avenues, for example, if we take the, the house and benefit one, because that's always the biggest um, matches. Local authorities can't investigate them anymore. They go to the Department for Working <coughs> Pensions. But there's still an awful lot of administrative work on the council has to actually take... Um, a lot, some of it boils down to what is fraud and what is an error. Um, errors can be caused by um, a lack of evidence to suggest a fraud has actually taken place. It could be an error by um, the council itself and not doing something um, on time. So each match has its own unique sort of indicators of whether there's liable to be fraud um, with, with, within that match. But as said, this. When the NFI first started out, it was probably more more fraud was getting found. But as every year goes on, the, the results of the positive outcomes coming from it are diminishing. OK, so can I assume that that's the case across the witnesses? Yeah. Okay. That's the same. I mean, we don't report in terms of percentages. What we do is we report in terms of actual numbers when we report to our own committee. So um, for the 2014 exercise, we were only reporting £91,000 worth of outcomes. Um, and we were reporting that that was an £82,000 decrease from the previous exercise. And of that, there's only a percentage of that is actually recoverable. There may be some of that isn't recoverable. And what we are trying to demonstrate, obviously, to our own committees is that there's the cost of employees' time in investigating this, so that's what we're trying to match is the outcome figure, which is relatively low of 91,000, with the cost associated of employee time of investigating all of the matches. That's where I'm going, Yvonne Douglas, is uh, at some point, do you draw a conclusion that the cost of running this system outweighs the benefit? Of it, uh, whether that benefit be recovery, whether it be uncovering fraud, whether it be uh, deterrent, does the cost of it outweigh the benefit? Well, we can do the, the crude number check in terms of here's the numbers in terms of outcomes, here's what it costs in employee times. What's really difficult to measure is the deterrent factor that all of this has, and I don't think we should underestimate that um, in terms of the, the just even the notification to our own employees to say to them, we're about to data match, which is one of the things that we're required to do. Please make sure that your records are up to date. 
I don't think we should underestimate, and it's very difficult to attach a figure to that. Um, and that isn't in there and it's difficult to capture, but it's always the um, the qualification that we attach to this is even just looking at the numbers, you're not really getting the full picture because to not do this, we could actually be in a much worse position. We just can't quantify it at this point in time. Mm -hmm. it, I, I may come back on that depending on what my colleagues ask. Mr Scott wanted to come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of make the point that, yeah, the numbers, the actual numbers that are reported in terms of actual fraud are relatively low, but what, what we do find is that uh, there potentially are errors to be disclosed, uh, you know, errors in national insurance numbers, errors in, in uh, uh, credit or reference <laughs> numbers and such like, which uh, allow us to uh, improve the quality of our data. And uh, at the same time, if we're not picking up too many issues through the NFI, then we're getting some kind of assurance that the systems that we have in place, the checks and balances and so on, uh, are reasonably robust. Uh, so, you know, the, the money side of it, uh, as Yvonne has indicated, uh, is, is not a huge amount, uh, but it's certainly worth getting, uh, and, and uh, the deterrent effect also is, is appropriate. Uh, and also, from, from my perspective, can I say to the committee, well, we've submitted all these key data sets which take in benefits, payroll, the creditor payments, and uh, having done the reviews, uh, uh, we're reasonably satisfied with the quality of our data. So in terms of providing assurance to the elected members that uh, the systems we have in place are robust, I think it does add something to the process. And just to be clear, Mr Scott, so you, so you are comfortable that the, the benefits outweigh the cost? I, th I think that the, that's perhaps the point that I made earlier, that we need to make sure that that remains the case. So if the, the process was to be expanded in any way, uh, we would need to be sure that any additional inputs that we were required to make uh, would be worthwhile in terms of the benefits that would be derived. Thank you very much. Okay, Ross Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, and before asking my questions, I should probably remind the committee that up until a couple of weeks ago, I was a councillor on Aberdeen City Council. Um, and then my question actually is directed to Mr um, Muldoon. Um, within the submission um, from Aberdeen City Council, um, it states that uh, instead of solely matching data against public bodies, consideration should be given to matching this information against HMRC data and that the wider scope would likely require legislative changes. However, it would allow more potential frauds to be identified. I just wonder if you could talk me through um, some of the benefits that you think um, such legislative change would bring. If there's any other uh, data sets uh, which could re increase the utility um, of the NFI um, and what the resource implications of that would be if it was to improve outcomes. Some of that stems back from when the, our experience of doing housing benefit investigations. The legislation for housing benefit investigations was very specific. We had the Social Security Administration Act. And I've, I've listed a couple of them um, in there. Now, the authority that investigators <coughs> were granted to do that allowed us certainly to compel financial institutions such as banks, um, credit reference agencies, so forth, to actually give us information that we could then use. We could also get this information from um, HMRC. Um, Circumstances are slightly different, but sort of the premise is still there. Social Security legislation allowed um, it used to be called the General Matching Service or um, H Housing Benefit Matching Service. It allowed matches to be undertaken, um, I think it was monthly or, or bi-monthly, comparing housing benefit data with data that, um, for example, employment data, um, payroll data, national insurance um, data. So these matches were done frequently and it helped when you were doing housing benefit investigations that you knew who was employed. Um, Obviously, we pay national insurance and tax, etc. So, if that record showed that somebody was in employment, they were claiming benefit, it was a relatively simple process. Obviously, they shouldn't be. So, we could then do the housing benefit investigation based on that solid information. However, we don't have that legislation to allow us to compel uh, financial institutions to actually basically talk to us, um, and that's where I see if additional legislation 
could be brought in by the Scottish Government um, to allow us to investigate but also to take that to the procurator fiscal because we then have hard evidence whereas at the moment we simply we don't, that avenue isn't open to to us um, in terms of the workload side of things it's already been mentioned in evidence that there is obviously a high volume of work for each investigation team and, and things are very busy if there was to be legislative change it was to come through parliament um would that increase your workload if you are referring things to the procurator fiscal and would new resource have to be put in and should that come nationally as well given it would be a national legislative change should Scottish government put resource into supporting that resourcing is always going to be an issue as well as we all know public authorities are under increasing um, financial scrutiny um, there would be a knock-on effect in the sense that it would if we had a, if, if we were investigating somebody at the moment we would look at it and say, right, well, we need to go to body A, body B, body C in order to obtain um, evidence. So if we had the additional authority, then we would be able to get, actually compel these organisations to give us information instead of, at the moment, within, we use the Data Protection Act. However, it, data holders can refuse to give us um, the information. So we're already wasting time, potentially, trying to get this information where we don't actually have we have authority to ask for it, but we cannot compel a data provider to give us the information. So if we had the authority to say, you must supply us by this, then it would allow us to take these investigations forward and allow them to submit to the Procurator Fiscal. So yes, that process would be slightly longer, but I do believe that it feeds into um, what Yvonne was talking about, is the deterrent factor, because then we were able to say, um, Aberdeen City Council, for example, referred you know X number of people to the procurator fiscal this year. It resulted in fines, sentences, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we, ju we we just don't have that um, that backing um, at the moment. Um, it was interesting because in um, I think it was in one of your previous answers. It's also in the submission. It's the example of the Aberdeen Exhibition and Conference Centre, um, and I think that's interesting because I think given the financial environment for councils across. Scotland, particularly with you know, depleting resource, councils are thinking of more innovative ways of delivering projects, um, whether that's capital projects, um, whatever. And I know in Aberdeen there's a number of them and it does involve private um, partners. So I just wonder if you could expand on how helpful you think it would be if consideration could be given to giving you know, in increased powers to Audit Scotland to kind of request that information from the, from the private sector. So if I kind of go back to the, the example of the, the authorised officer's powers for um, social and social security legislation. So if we had um, a suspicion that a private company was employing people um, and that these, some of these employees were claiming benefits, the authority was there then to go to the private company and say, OK, we want a list of all your employees you must supply us with names, national insurance numbers, addresses, etc., etc. So when that information was received, we would then match it up against the benefit systems, and then anybody obviously found that was working and claiming benefits, we would be part of a, um, an investigation. Now, it's all it's all public money. I'm certainly not saying that the companies that are involved um, in Aberdeen Exhibition Centre uh, that was just a, an example for capital projects. But if we were then able to say, okay, if you want, if companies want to tender for work um, from public or local authorities, then because of the, the amounts that are involved, I think this one was at three hundred million pounds. They're, they're substantial um, amounts of money. We should then be saying, well, if you want to bid for this work, you're there going to have to provide us with assurances or provide us with data in order that we can do similar checks to make sure that both the organisation and the staff are not basically committing fraud against um, basically any local authority. It doesn't necessarily have to be the sort of the authority where, where they're working for. And I think that by strengthening the NFI legislation, um, Audit Scotland could then perhaps take a bigger role in looking at sort of some of the, the major players. Um, it's it's not been done before. 
so we, we, we simply don't know um, if it would be um, worthwhile. But certainly, as, um, as my colleagues have said, identifying more fraud has a knock-on effect for resourcing and um, the time taken to obviously or do these within the investigative bodies. Sure. Um, <clears throat> and actually, I suppose to the, to the other authorities, I mean, is there a consensus around about that the, in terms of these proposed considerations and changes? Um, would there be agreement amongst other councils that actually that could be some welcome changes? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I would like to support the um, the appeal for further powers for our investigating officers because um, the, it makes it much more difficult. I mean, the NFI exercise, we are uh, being given lots of matches from which there may be some... Um, fraud identified. Now, once we have that fraud identified, we then have to investigate to see if this person is subletting their house, if this person is working um, uh, on long-term sick and working elsewhere. So we then need to contact um, relevant people to get information, background information about um, the people who may be involved in the potential fraud. Um, are they wor um, living in the house that they say they're living in? Can we link them to other properties? Now, um, our investigators used to have very strong powers under the Social Security Act, and now, because they're no longer housing benefit investigators, they have only um, limited powers and able to request information under the Data Protection Act. And, um, as has been said, <coughs> that does tie their hands. So I would support that. Also, because a number of our um, investigations have been related to housing, and as you say, we've had a lot of houses back, but we haven't been able to prosecute anybody because we don't have any legislation to prosecute against. So just uh, mention the Prevention of Social Housing Fraud Act again. Okay. Thank you, convener. Monica Lennon. Thanks, convener. Um, I feel like I've learned quite um, a bit already this morning, um, but I'm a little bit concerned. It, it appears that everyone's drowning in data, and I wonder if you are a, a potential fraudster or criminal uh, sitting at home, if, if you're a bit more relaxed uh, about things, because it seems like there are resource issues here. But I just wonder um, if, if um, witnesses can say if they think this initiative um, is... Um, helping to to reduce the, the risk of, of fraud and, and crime and indeed some of the errors, or it might actually um, create the conditions for people to be a bit more innovative and creative. Mr Scott. <clears throat> it's, quite a, it's quite a difficult one. I mean, I think that the, uh, the, the NFI process, as far as I'm concerned, as indicated earlier, uh, you know, provides a degree of assurance to the council on the adequacies of its systems. Uh, as one or two of my colleagues have mentioned, uh, the, the regulatory framework for investigating frauds uh, has altered somewhat. Uh, I, I, do, I, I don't have a huge amount of detail on that, and there may well be uh, merit in having a look at that again. But uh, certainly from my perspective, the National Fraud Initiative uh, processes a whole volume of data, uh, and the and, and, uh, gives indicators of fraud and so you know participation in that is very welcome and I think it's it's quite useful. Can you know, just before um, the other witnesses um, respond like Ross Thompson like to declare that <coughs> until a couple of weeks ago I was an elected member at South Lancashire Council. Thanks please continue. Okay. From, from our perspective we would say that um, in regards to fraud our first line of defence is our own internal <coughs> controls and that's where we place greatest reliance on, and that's what the audit function looks at and provides assurance over, is the effectiveness of those controls. What the NFI is doing is, is providing additional data for us to almost double check that those controls that should be in place, so none of the, th the things that are, that are being identified through the NFI exercise should be happening because we should have internal controls in place that prevent that. But what it is able to identify is, is human error or or fraud that hasn't been picked up by our internal controls. So um, I, I think probably the, the point I would really like to make is just that our own internal control environment is the kind of first line of defence in relation to, to deterring fraud and to um, also identifying it um, at, 
an early stage to allow us to prevent it happening. I wonder if I can pick up on a point I think that Brian Muldoon made it at the start um, when you talked about the other routine work if people are making complaints or whistleblowers, um, whether that's the public or, or staff within the organisation. I just wonder if people are aware and get frustrated that there is a time lag and it takes a long time. So you've got your data matches and we're hearing there's thousands of them, but people are lifting the phone um, and saying, I think there might be an issue here. If, for example, the public know that it's going to take a long time before that's looked at or anyone gets back to them, they might wonder, oh, what's the point in bothering? Is that a concern that, that people have? Yes, frankly. Um, we do have members of the public and also staff um, as well that would come to us and say, we believe that this claim or this isn't quite right. Can you can you look at it? It's We can't go back to people and actually say, right, this is what we have done. This is what the outcome of what the information that you've given us, we're simply not allowed to. And that, when you have members of the public phoning up the hotline and saying, right, I want to tell you that um, Joe Bloggs is doing ABC, all we can do is say, thank you very much, we will have a look at that. Now, several weeks later, that person, it happens frequently, will phone up and say, I told you about Joe Bloggs, you've not done anything with it. Well, <coughs> yes, we actually have, we have looked at it, but we're not allowed to go back to them under that protection and policies to actually sort of give them any information. So from a customer's point of view, yes, it does look as if the local authority or certainly the, the investigative team hasn't done anything, but we have. But that has to be measured up against what the amount of information that they have given us. Is that going to take us a long time to actually pursue or are we better um, putting resources against, for example, the National Fraud Initiative or some of the other initiatives that we're constantly um, working on. There isn't, a, there isn't an easy answer um, to it. It simply is we can't... We have to do a risk-based... Um, or we have to take a risk-based approach. Um, how much time is it going to take us to, to look at the inquiry? What's the liable uh, or likely um, outcome? Um, do we have to say, right, OK, we're not going to deal with that one just now because we've got 20 other cases that are higher priority? And that's, that's just the way that we that we operate. Um, so from a customer point of view, I accept that it may look as if we're not doing anything and that some people might be getting... Um, it may look like people might be getting... or being allowed... or fraud allowed to continue, sorry. But we will, we will look at it and assess it as best as we can. So, I mean, in order for for this initiative to work um, and to minimise and, and, and tackle frauds, um, you know, would you all accept that, that you do need to have buy-in from the wider public and have that confidence that people feel that there is a process um, that, 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 that will work and, and can be effective? How do you and each of your authorities um, try and, and sort of promote awareness of this initiative um, and some of the successes? I'm really getting that is how do you you know, um, I suppose market this and show that there are some positive outcomes. Certainly that would be for um, our findings to um, the Audit Risk and Scrutiny um, Committee, um, where we have cases of particular interest that have went through the criminal justice system, um, we will issue appropriate press releases. Um, but over and above that, on the when we are putting results um, into the, the National Fraud Initial Database, there are, um, there are areas that we can actually put areas of interest where we will upload um, any, anything that maybe we've taken to court, maybe there's been a sentence um, or somebody's been fined or, or whatever, um, whatever the sanction is. Um, and we then leave that side of it to Audit Scotland to be able to sort of um, to publicise. Yeah. Heather or Aline? Good, you mind? Um, I must say, <laughs> before I started working in the job I'm working in, I'd never heard of the National Fraud Initiative, and I think that's probably quite common. Um, and that is one of the points that I think could be uh, could be made that if people knew that we were matching all this data, well, 
whenever a new privacy notice comes out, you get the occasional um, headline in the papers that the big data and people are uh, snooping. But if people knew that we were able to um, take your data from one organisation and another organisation, I think that would be a really helpful deterrent. To answer the question, I don't think Midlothian Council advertises the fact that they take part in the National Fraud Initiative, apart from the fact that every form you have to fill in has a privacy statement on it saying we will share your data with Audit Scotland uh, for the purposes of the prevention and detection of fraud. Um, this, but it's small print at the bottom of a form. Um, I think it would be worthwhile to publicise it further. As um, Brian was saying, if we have, whenever we have a, um, a successful case, we publicise that. But um, as I say, um, it isn't very frequent. In the past, when we did the last exercise, um, <clears throat> we did put an article in the local newspaper and we put something on our website to say, um, you know, all about the, the National Fraud Initiative. Um, and in the middle of them, we also do an annual corporate fraud report and we report on all fraud type work that we've done, we've done and the um, savings that have been made from that. Uh, a big part of that for our council is, is at the moment is the recovery of council houses. Um, as we try and, I mean, that goes to all our various committees, which are all public documents. Um, but I think we definitely need to, I agree with Heather, we need to, we need to um, focus on the, the preventative side and to try and get the, the message out there that, that we're actively doing this type of work to try and prevent the fraud in the first place. Are there any examples, um, again, Heather or, or Elaine, where you have been able to promote, you know, your successful outcome? Has that in any way um, triggered other inquiries or people saying, oh, actually, there was a pattern here, or does that sort of a trigger anything in people? Or? We have a, a reporting um, mechanism on our website where people can report anonymously um, any allegations. And we do a, every year we send a, an article in the tenants newsletter, and after that, that sometimes triggers a bit more response via that that um, communication line. Um, and we all also have done uh, internal training sessions of our staff, um, all raising awareness about fraud, and that actually. And ended up being quite a lot of um, referrals from our own housing staff. So I think it's just, again, just getting the message out there, uh, uh, the awareness that, that we have this resource and, and the type of... Uh, we can do local data matching as well. So it, it kind of complements the NFI. So there's some matches that we do in Middle Lothian that <clears throat> is, they're not part of NFI and we've, they've been quite fruitful. Um, things like matching joint tenants to single-person discount and things like that. So it's, again, just thinking of other ways we can use data to, to, to match and um, highlight any potential frauds. OK, what about South Lanarkshire Council in terms of um, promoting awareness of NFI and, and to try to build up sort of public confidence? Um, well, we do. We, we have something at the, the start of every exercise on our website um, that advises the public we're about to start the exercise and explains what we're doing, all the matches that we do. Um, we have in the past put um, notices in our, um, our local South Lanarkshire reporter that goes around the, um, each household. We promote it quite widely within our staff. We do employee bulletins and management bulletins and messages on pay slips about the time that we are um, about to start the NFI and again on the benefits forms and things there's always a, a, a statement on that advising people your details can be matched. Um, we prepare a report that goes to the Risk and Audit Scrutiny Forum on the results of the NFI so that does tell people, um, it tells the members and it's a public document on um, the investigations we've carried out, the results of them, where we've identified error. Um, we don't tend to publicise um, in, in the um, on our network, on our internet, or in, in public newspapers. The results from that it really is just through the the forum. Um, so we do, we do a wee bit of publicity at the, at the beginning to comply with the, the fair processing notices. Um, I would say it's probably heavily weighted towards benefits um, claimants and employees. But we do put some information on the internet as well to to advise the public that we are doing the exercise. And do you feel you have enough resources within your team to keep up with the the volume of work? 
Well, with an internal audit, we coordinate the exercise, so we, we don't do um, many of the investigations unless we have put something in our audit plan. We allocate time every year in our audit plan for um, the, the NFI. Um, we do a, a cost-benefit analysis at the end to make sure that the, the, um, the amount of time and, and resources spent on it is not outweighing the, the benefits that we're getting and, and so far we do review that every every exercise so and, and so far we are um identifying more i would say it's more error than fraud um within the council at the moment so we are identifying more and, and taking corrective action than we are spending in resources so um it is benefit at the moment okay um, unless Athol Scott wants to add anything to that particular No, I think set of our, our processes are relatively similar here. <clears throat> One of the other things I was wondering about, because I know in the Audit Scotland um, report, there's, I suppose, a number of... Um, tips on how to work more efficiently. And one of the concerns raised was that many participants um, are not using the latest sort of software enhancements. And I just was wondering, when you were all talking about um, resources and again, just the sort of volume of work, um, what's happening in each of your authorities to make sure that staff are keeping up to date um, with the new features on the web application? How do you ensure best practice? And, and do you speak to, to each other and your respective councils to sort of, I suppose, exchange good practice and, and learn from each other. In Aberdeen, we have um, the investigative team have a dedicated area on the council's intranet um, that does relate to national fraud um, initiative, um, how the matches should be done. The national fraud website is also very good. It has training material on it. Um, which gives staff clear guidelines as to um, how they should actually be doing um, the matches. Um, so from <coughs> that point of view, we we do as best as what sorry as best as we can, sort of to make sure that um, staff are certainly aware of the the latest matches that um, are available. As one of my colleagues said, throughout the year we do get updates um, from um, from Audit Scotland. Um, certainly from our, from my point of view, we are not always able to um, fully resource those updates. We tend, we, some, of, some of the times we rely on the information that come in at the, the beginning um, of the year. Or, so, for example, the last data match was received um, in, uh, in January. So, although it does get updated, we don't always have the time to go in and have a look to see what the most up-to-date um, data is. Um, it is something that we are, um, certainly, we are working on. When you say, um, Brian, well done, that you're working on that, is that trying to get more resources for that particular task? Is it just not having enough people? Is that what the problem is? Some local authorities have a dedicated investigative resource who will do the majority of the National Fraud Initiative um, work. Other local authorities don't. They, they would tend to sort of put that out to sort of staff, um, obviously, sort of to look at fraud and errors. Um, you could have a massive fraud team, um, and yes, you would be able to sort of look at these things a lot quicker. However, as I said earlier on, there are cost implications for the local authorities to actually have that um, um, in place. Um, in Scotland, we have the Scottish Local Authority Investigators Group that all local authorities are um, members of. Um, and we meet um, once every six months or once um, or quarterly. And that's the meeting where managers or staff um, attend um, and we do share good practices. We find out what the latest techniques are available for um, for detecting fraud, what problems that we occur, uh, what problems that um, that we find. So between that forum, um, there's more online um, forums as well through the the Knowledge Hub. We do share good practices, so that we're we're dealing with these issues as quickly um, as as we can. I'm conscious of time, Kevin. I've just got one more 
question, um, but if anyone wanted to add anything briefly to that, that would be fine. But I just wondered, um, obviously, this um, relies on other organisations playing their part and responding quickly to, to inquiries. Um, again, in your experiences, um, can that be quite a slow process when you're trying to get information from other organisations? And likewise, do you sometimes struggle yourselves to deal with inquiries um, promptly? South Lanarkshire. Um, there is a facility on the website to share comments with other um, councils when you're investigating a match. Um, the problem and delays can happen through that is that your sample of investigating uh, of matches that you're investigating might not necessarily be the same so you have to keep going in and making sure that comments have been answered and maybe follow up um, that's not such a big issue I think probably the main um, delays come from the, the DWP side um, and that's when we don't have any um, investigators for benefit left in, in South Lanarkshire they all transferred over so our um, employees can only take it so far. And when they um, then make the decision, this looks like a fraud rather than an error, the information all gets passed over to DWP. That's where the delay can be because then they will need to do their investigation to then confirm to us whether it's a, a fraud or not. Um, so I would say that's our, our main delay rather than any other organisations. Um, but what I would say in South Lanarkshire, we do record that as an overpayment as soon as we um, identify it as an overpayment rather than waiting for the fraud um, to be confirmed. So we will take the steps to start recovering and, and taking corrective action. The only thing is that the website will not be updated to say whether it's fraud or error until the DWP have confirmed it. So that's probably where the delay is. Um, and it's just keeping track of the the investigations that you've passed over to DWP to make sure that we can close them down um, our side. So um, I would say that was probably the the main. The, the other the other delays um, really are, are easy to to cope with. It is contacting other authorities, and that can be done through the the website. Thank you. Mr Scott, is that your experience of the website? Yeah, I was just going to mirror that in terms of <clears throat> the website has a facility on it where you can share information with the other side of the match, as it were. And uh, it also has contact details of the various officers who are responsible for the different types of match, be it housing or benefits or whatever. So you have an email contact and you also have a sharing facility. So what we tend to do is we share the we share the the comment or the question through the secure uh, facility and then if we don't get a response within a couple of weeks uh, we'll then email the person out with the NFI process and just say uh, we, referred a, we referred a question to you in relation to NFI please check the website so that the, secu you know, the, the detailed information is kept secure but we still have contact, contact details to, to get in touch with other bodies so we don't really have a big issue with that. Forgive me, because I'm obviously not familiar with this <coughs> website, but is there scope for things to be easily missed? It sounds like it relies on um, a lot of um, you know, um, human input rather than just the computer telling you everything. So could things easily be forgotten or missed, or do you get constant alerts and reminders? I don't know, well, maybe perhaps <laughs> I'm misleading you a wee bit just through lack of detail, but on any particular match, uh, if we have an issue take the comparison I made earlier between the Murray Council and the Highland Council. If we had an issue in Murray Council where perhaps eh, we had an employee working as a supply teacher two days a week and the Highland Council entry suggested that that same person was working five days a week at the Highland Council, we would send through the system a request, please confirm the status of your employee. And then we would hope that the Highland Council would come back and say, that employee was previously full-time, which goes back to the point Brian was me, but they've now moved on to a part-time contract. So that then satisfies us that the two part-time contracts are okay, but you can share information with every other body who participates just by, through an internal mechanism within the NFI system. So, eh. Uh, I would say 
the FI website, there is a message that comes up that says you have got shared comments that you haven't read, so you can go in and you can um, focus in on those and um, deal with them. Okay. So there is a flag. Um, but only when you go into the system, you don't get constant reminders to go in and check. So you have to be in the system to know. OK, so could that be improved, do you think? Um, well, I think during the, the investigation cycle, you're in and out of that system so often anyway. Um, I don't think it needs any any change, really. Thank you, Thank you very much, Willie Coffey. I could just continue that thread there, that interesting thread there that Monica Lennon was leading us in. I presume you can decide for yourselves which kind of direction of travel to pursue in terms of potential fraud. You do, you're not driven by the data matches presented to you. Um, for example, if someone, a perpetrator, has exposed one particular year, I presume you follow that person in subsequent years. You don't just wait for a random data set to be given to you to be your checklist, I presume. You do that, don't you? You carry on checking someone who's been found to be. No. You don't. No. We, we, we don't. Each allegation. We don't watch somebody, so so to speak. However, if if information came in on somebody on one year, um, and we didn't get round to reviewing that data match, it will show up on the next year's. Sort of data match. So sort of, maybe to give a bit of context, when when we get the data matches in, so for example, I, th I think we got about four thousand data matches, but out of that, there was just over twelve hundred, if memory serves, that were actually recommended, so as, as high priority through um, Audit Scotland. So that's the ones that we will focus on, um, certainly first of all. Now, of the other matches that we haven't got round to perhaps looking at, because it obviously it could take a year, as we've discussed earlier, those, those matches will appear on the next NFI report. But we've already got a new set of higher recommended matches. So we don't keep an eye on... We simply don't have the resources to watch one particular person. Um, <laughs> if a person is, is, is caught exposed to defrauding the system and something or other, surely to goodness you would check it the second year as well for that person? Or do you not? <laughs> that match may not appear on the, I, I, I the I know that. Not, that's what I mean. It's not in a matching set of data that uh -huh. you're given, but you now have intelligence about a behaviour that leads to fraud. Would you not check that in the second year and the third year as well? If there is a case, then we would deal with it, that we discover, then we would deal with it at the time and take them, case. remove their house if we would, if, if perhaps this is someone who's subletting a house, then we would uh, remove the house from them and deal with that incident. What, what we do do is we do some mm -hmm. profile matching. So, for example, we will look at, not necessarily on the NFI, so we'll look at um, what the latest reports are that might indicate sort of the whether males or females of our particular age are more liable to sort of commit fraud. So we do things like that, um, but that's out with that's out with um, the, the the national fraud um, initiative. What about you guys and Maria? So far, do you follow up repeat offenders in a sense? <laughs> to have the repeat offenders. I think that's the, the point of trying to make that when they show up, if we've investigated and they've committed fraud, we stop it at that point. Um, the same person? Well, we're, we're hoping that we've taken the house off them and we're, they've, oh. or, or they've, they've had the sanction or we've dismissed them if they're an employee and, and we've moved on. And if we've oh. dismissed an employee... Um, because of fraud, it will be on, on the record, so if they try to come back, we will, we will see that. Um, okay. I think also in, in terms of audit, what our job is to look at, why did it happen in the first place? So we have improvement plans that follow behind the NFI exercise, so it's trying to understand why did our internal controls allow this to happen? So part of our job is to go in and make recommendations and suggest improvements to to stop this happening. So even if that same individual had to go through that same process again and try to defraud us a second time, 
that the action is meant to strengthen our internal controls to prevent them being able to do it a second time rather than tracking the individual. We're trying to strengthen our systems all the time so that we make them stronger and we fraud proof them, for want of a better word. All right, that's very interesting. I wonder if I could just ask again about the, the role of HMRC. Uh, I think uh, both Elaine and Yvonne, you mentioned HMRC in your submissions as being, it would be useful if they were included within the, the scope of the NFI. But I do see from one of your submissions that HMRC does provide some data for us. But I think you, what you were probably getting at was, could they perhaps provide a whole host of data? But I think you, you then said, suggested that that might take us out with the kind of public sphere of public interest. Um, could you just clarify what you mean there? And have you, would you say that you've maybe lost or had to close down particular lines of inquiry because you weren't able to access HMRC data? Or did you request it and it was denied? Or could you just give us a little flavour of why you're saying HMRC should be included? Uh, we've never formally approached HMRC for data, so we haven't been turned down as such. Um, it's just in um, other investigations that we've had ongoing. Um, we've been able to flag up one of the examples we've given was conflict of interest um, for an employee that worked uh, for us. And we were just flagging up the fact that if we had this information, we would be able to match payroll data, so they would be able to come and say to us, of the employees that work for South Lancashire Council, we have information that they are also um, an PAYE employment for the following people. Um, and again, it, it was just to allow us to, to try and manage it, particularly in relation to high-risk areas where we know that people might be contracting on behalf of the Council. Um, we do um, do some work with HMRC through the real-time information, um, and the information comes to that, and that helps us with the benefits overpayment side because it flags up where people haven't declared additional income. So we do use that information, um, and that is in place um, at this point in time. We just thought it could be extended into other spheres that we thought would be useful um, in terms of the kind of wider audit works that we do for the authority. Mm -hmm. Elaine, you mentioned HMRC to begin with, what, what would the advantage to us of bringing HMRC within the whole scope of the NFI? I think it would, it would just provide more data and, and things like um, kind of probably the benefit side of somebody's claim and benefits with Midlothian and they were highlighted with HMRC as receiving a salary from a private company. That's the type of information we would never be party to. Um, so that, that's kind of the kind of ideas that we had and I think particularly other things like, like so possibly um, DVLA and th things like that, where there's public information which could be useful um, in the exercise. Okay, so it's not that, I mean, had you approached HMRC for no. this information? No. And, no, I think uh, our thought was that these would be extra data sets that would be useful to bring into the NFI mix so that um, the NFI is checking our employment records against South Lanarkshire's employment records and if as well as that we could also be matching against HMRC's records because they have records for everyone's employment then that would be very useful. Yeah. Can, can I just add, there isn't presently a legal gateway for local authorities to actually approach HMRC to request the information. Um, that was done under the Social Security sort of side of it when we were um, sort of dealing with housing benefit um, investigations. It sounds as though everybody's kind of saying that that would be a useful extension to this whole initiative if HMRC was was a, within scope and there was a legal gateway to request the information that you, you sought. Sounds like it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Alex Neil. Convener, can I just go back to the answer, an earlier answer that uh, Yvonne gave in terms of the cost versus the outcomes and the benefits of... Um, the National Fraud Initiative, and I think you mentioned a figure of 91,000 that had been recovered. Was that for a year? Yeah, that was in relation to the 2014 NFI exercise. So what we were doing was taking the Audit Scotland report yeah. and reporting that, but we also added the South Lancashire Council context to give our own members um, the data that related to our own, our own authority. So effectively in South Lanarkshire in that year, £91,000 was recovered as a result of the anti-fraud anti activity? 91,000 was identified as an outcome. Right. The recovery process starts thereafter. So. And do you know the recovery figure? I don't have the specific recovery figure 
um, but I'm fairly confident in saying it won't be 100% because there are some that we simply won't pursue right. um, because of the age of the individual yeah. or the particular circumstances. But as a, a policy, um, we, we do seek to recover all overpayments. Right. Be it so error so or based fraud. in previous years, f what kind of percentage would you expect roughly to, to recover? I don't have that figure to hand. I'm, right. Um, Even ballpark, is it 50%? Is it 75%? I would say that the problem with the um, recovery is usually... Um, the majority of our fraud and error comes from housing benefits um, and to recover that takes a, a period of time, it gets right. reduced off their benefits so um, recovery for, the, for these will still be ongoing <coughs> right. so there right. is a chance that that could take two years because you're only allowed to recover so much at yes. a time when the person's right. on benefits so it's not a straight, I mean things like where there's a du duplicate payment and a creditor that will be covered immediately yep. in full. The benefits, which, as I say, is the majority right. of our fraud and error, takes the time over. And, um, and can I ask you about the costs of recovery? I mean, for example, are sheriff officers used to recover some of these debts? They can be. We have a, a debt recovery process in place within the council, and it goes through the stages of first reminder, second reminder, and it will eventually go to um, sheriff officers if, right. if it needs to. Now, I hear you said, Yvonne, about it's impossible to um, quantify the deterrent effect of what's happening, and I totally appreciate that. But looking at the actual cost to, to get to that 91k figure, what is the cost to the council of your department and, and the people involved in this activity? Um, in that year? And that's In that same report, we were saying that um, the employee cost attached to it were approximately 27,000 right. um, and that's us basing it on um, salary costs of the individuals involved in, in the exercise right. so we were still able to demonstrate there is, a, there is a difference what we were really pulling out in the report was that difference is becoming more marginal as the outcomes are reducing Yeah. so even without taking the deterrent impact in uh, you were recovering three times what the cost was of actually um, carrying out the exercise. Yeah, I mean there was there was still a clear benefit that we could demonstrate. Yeah. Um, and the benefit to the council exceeded the cost, um, and that that's assurance that we're expected to provide as as part of this right. as, as the exercise. Now, to some extent, this is a more general question, but how much of that would have been recovered without the national fraud initiative? If you look back to the years when you didn't have the National Fraud Initiative. Um, would you have recovered that money anyway? Or would you only have recovered it because you're involved in the National Fraud Initiative? Or what, would there have been half of it recovered? What, what's the added value? Where's the additionality of the National Fraud Initiative? I haven't really got that analysis. I mean, there would be an element of it would be recovered, but I would suggest the majority of it wouldn't have been recovered, right. particularly in relation to duplicate payments, because if you've paid somebody twice and it hasn't been identified through normal monitoring processes, it's highly unlikely that that would be picked up at a later stage. And it's only really the NFI exercise that, that's going to pick up duplicate payments. Um, in terms of the benefit side, where we're identifying most of our outcomes come from, because people's circumstances are constantly under review, there's a chance that we may have identified it, but I, I think the NFI is really the added value, and I would say the kind of accounts for probably the significant part of that is because we did the NFI exercise. So there's real added value in the NFI exercise from your point of view? There is, yeah. Right. Can I ask you, and this is my final question, about the scope of the NFI? Uh, I mean, obviously, we all want to minimise fraud right through the public sector. Um, but obviously the emphasis of the and, and the particular uh, focus of the NFI is on housing benefit and related activity. Um, but do you have colleagues to look at a wider uh, issue of fraud? I mean, for example, we've had recent cases in other councils of fraud allegations resulting from uh, activity related to framework contracts and the misuse, allegedly, of framework contracts. So would you cover that or would the national the national fraud initiative doesn't really cover that. 
Um, so do you think there's value in extending the scope of the f National Fraud Initiative to cover these aspects of fraud, not just the people who are uh, recipients of housing benefit? Um, I do. Um, in relation to your particular example about framework contracts, I would, you would need to think carefully as to what match you were going to make that would identify fraud in that um, particular um, area. Well, an example would be, a very good example from recent experience would be if the framework contract is for school roofing mm -hmm. and yet it's used to provide school doors and a range of other activity, then clearly uh, that, that, that would lead you to investigate at least why that happened. Yeah, and I think uh, for most authorities that would form part of their annual audit plan rather than a data match because right. at, at the end of the day, to, to do the match, we would probably be taking um, contractors off of a contract register um, and probably high-level detail from invoices, which would not give you that information that somebody was under a framework for a particular yeah. um, type of work but was actually delivering something differently. That kind of work comes from probably more detailed audit where people are actually going in and having a look at a process and pulling an actual sample of projects to compare what we contracted for and what we actually received. I'm not sure that the NFI at a high level would be able to match um, and identify these kind of specific issues. The report in one council suggested, the audit internal audit report suggested that there have been malpractice going on for 15 years until mm -hmm until an anonymous letter was received, nobody in audit, external, internal, or whatever, had identified it. Mm -hmm. And so that suggests to me that the auditing of these contracts is wholly inadequate for mm -hmm. identifying where there's potential fraud. But, but it's that, to be fair, that's out with your responsibility at the moment. It's certainly not particularly related to NFI exercise, Aye. but it is a challenge for local authorities in terms yeah. of our internal audit work um, and in terms of making sure that we, we target our resources in the correct area and target them in areas of high risk. And these are areas that um, we're, we're learning all the time in terms of where the risk lies and um, we're reassessing where the, the where our work needs to be. So in procurement, that that's becoming a greater area of focus for local authorities. Yeah, OK. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I thank all the witnesses for their attendance this morning? Um, and I'll suspend the meeting briefly to allow a changeover.
second panel this morning, um, Russell Frith, Assistant Auditor General from Audit Scotland, Darren Shillington, Senior Data Man Matching Manager at the Cabinet Office, um, Neil Gray, Director, Northern Ireland Audit Office, um, and Anthony Barrett, Assistant Auditor General for Wales, and David Rees, Governance Manager for the Welsh Audit Office. Um, can I thank you all for responding to our call for evidence and also for travelling from across the UK to be with us this morning. It is very much appreciated. Um, to begin with, if the, is there anything in the quite extensive session we held um, earlier on um, mentioned by the first panel that particularly stood out for you that, that you want to deal with just now? Um, Russell. Yeah, if I could uh, say from my point of view as the person within Audit Scotland who's overseen the exercise in Scotland since it started in about 2004, um, it was actually quite pleasing to hear the, the, the positive uh, comments coming from those who are actually at the sharp end of, of, of the exercise. Um, certainly recognise some of the points that they were making about the volume of matches, and that is precisely why the uh, Cabinet Office team provide the software tools to um, all the bodies taking part that enable them to uh, filter and prioritise those matches so that they can concentrate on those that are likely, most likely, to generate uh, a result. So uh, they, they talked about there being several thousand matches, which is absolutely right. But because the NFI is a relatively mechanical exercise, the, the matches will include those, take housing benefit, for example, where somebody has uh, not shown any income on the housing benefit claim, but maybe earning £200 a week. That is a match. So is uh, something where they've declared that they're earning £198 a week, but their payroll data shows that they're earning £200 a week. So at the gross level, the matches don't distinguish between a really significant error and or a difference and a minor difference. That's why the filter tools are provided to help councils and other participants to focus on those that are most likely to give a, a result. And we, to be clear, as Audit Scotland, we do not expect them to investigate every match. So if they've started with the, the big ones and for whatever reason they're getting to find that they are legitimate, we don't expect them to then go on and do all the very small ones in the same match set. Okay. Is there anything any of the other panel would pick up on? Um, Mr would, Shillington? Sorry. I would certainly echo that. Um, that. That's one of the challenges we face. It's around the balance between giving the authorities the matches and the technology to allow them to identify those and meet their own criteria for investigation and obviously not overloading them and not sort of making it appear there are too many and they're overfaced with it. So I think that's one of the challenges and, and one of the drivers we've got is around improving that technology still. We're looking at ways we can improve that further um, and that sort of rate of return, if you like, we were talking about the 91,000, the 27,000, that, that's a key focus for us and looking at whether there are other external data sets like credit reference agencies and other sources of information that we can bring in. Um, they also talk, talked around the fact that it, it's obviously an every two years and they get a sort of a batch of matches and you know it takes quite a while to, to work through those matches one, that's one of the reasons why we've looked at this application checking service which again you alluded to which is around preventative um controls which are controls that can be embedded into internal controls again they talked about internal controls so it's about working with them and giving them the tools and the technology to allow them to use use it effectively to target fraud Okay, that's very helpful. Uh, Mr Barrett? Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm sure the committee will, will return to the, the issue of cost and benefit, um, but uh, I'd probably just make the point in terms of um, cost of recovery, etc., one shouldn't forget that the, the fraud has been stopped and it would have continued for quite some years, potentially, um, without um, uh, having been identified. So there's also that element of the cost to bear in mind that it has been stopped. Thank okay. you. Mr Gray, anything to add? No, I have nothing to add to that. Convener. Thank you very much. Liam Kerr. Thank you. Uh, given the time, you'll forgive me if I just fire a couple of uh, points over. We heard um, about the timing and frequency of the process. And Mrs Shillington, you just picked up on the two years there. Uh, is the timing and frequency different across the jurisdictions? Uh, and if so, is, are there any lessons that we can be learning from that? 
hear about the main exercise. Um, no, it's it's pretty similar across across the UK. So most of the exercise is undertaken every two years, as you've heard. Elements of it, so that there is a council tax single person discount match that we undertake annually. Um, some parts of the UK, so that's undertaken annually in England. Um, that you, there, was a, there was a challenge there around should it be done more often, and, and I know they talked about quarterly, yearly. I suppose just in terms of context, there are 1,300 organisations that provide around 8,000 data sets. Um, around 300 million pieces of information. Um, there are lots of challenges there around data quality, processing that and going through a process that allows you to generate matches that are, are effective and valuable to those participants. Um, and there are cost implications. So clearly that is something you can look at and you, you can do the exercise more regularly, but it, it's obviously that risk reward and that balance. And, and I think that the power of NFI is about bringing that intelligence together from across the organizations. Um, so again, um, in terms of timing, taking the data in October, releasing the matches in January, that's around making sure we try and capture as much information as we can. And when we release those matches in January, they're as complete as possible. So not all the data comes in on the 1st of October, as you can imagine. Um, we probably get around 90% of the data by the time we cut off in December and then we start the matching process. Um, but that also allows for data quality issues and that. So it, there are balances there. You could undertake the exercise more often, but it is that risk reward. <coughs> right. In, in an ideal world, would you say it would be worth doing more often, though? I mean, if, if the cost benefit was not a consideration, ideally, would you do it more often? Yeah, we've got we've got a strategy that looks at over the next five years a journey that would allow us to sort of look at automation of that data collection and then allow us to do it on a more regular and potentially real time basis. So that that's certainly the strategy and the direction we'd like to go. All things being being equal. I understand, uh, Mr. Shillington. You also in in your statement you talk about uh, the where where there's no follow up to the matches where where a decision's taken. Let's not pursue this. Uh, you describe that as this means the fraud continues, uh, which suggests to me the implication of that is that there is fraud there and it's being missed, which wasn't the impression I got from uh, a number of the witnesses this morning. And uh, Mr Barrett, you talked about that the fraud has been stopped. Uh, but again, that's, that predicates on there being fraud there in the first place, which wasn't the impression I necessarily got. Uh, could you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, for, uh, this is about a risk-based approach. This is about balancing resources um, available to target the fraud. So, I mean, what, what we're talking about here is NFI is a source of referrals. There are other sources of referrals, um, and there are frauds in there, and the track record of the NFI exercise has proven that, that you know, we, we find fraud across a wide range of areas. Um, having said that, obviously not every match indicates fraud. They may indicate their anomalies, which may represent fraud, and they need further consideration. Um, and we would never suggest that all authorities need to therefore follow up every particular match in there. Um, so it is a balanced approach and a targeted approach about looking at their own environment, their own resources, their own sort of awareness and their own internal controls and their fraud risk appetite, and then targeting those that meet that. But I mean, I think we all have to accept there is fraud against the public sector that goes on. We're not going to detect 100% of it. We don't have the resources. So it's about using the resources you've got and targeting them. Yes. And, and I suspect the deterrent point's particularly important, but I suspect my colleagues are going to ask about that as well. I'll stand down. Okay, Alex Neal. Thank you, convener. Uh, can I first of all ask, according to the Cabinet Office evidence, the savings in Scotland uh, as a result of uncovering fraud since the scheme was uh, created is about £110 million a year, which is an average of around £9 million in the 13 years that it's been going. Can I ask about the profile? I mean, extrapolating the evidence we had from the first panel, it would appear that because of the effectiveness of the National Fraud Initiative, the annual amounts being uh, discovered uh, as being fraudulent are actually going down because of the deterrent impact, uh, which is immeasurable at the moment. Uh, and, and therefore the profile, although the average is £9 million a year over 13 years, would it be right to say that if you look at the more recent years, that figure's a lot lower than the average, and if you look at the early years, it was a lot higher, simply because people were being caught who otherwise wouldn't have been? Certainly the um, 
the profile of the areas where the saving, the outcomes have, have been generated has changed uh, since the exercise started. Um, when it first started, housing benefit was the biggest single uh, value um, outcome from the, from the exercise, uh, followed uh, by um, pensioners, um, pensions being paid to deceased persons. And clearly the first exercise that was run on that particular one did pick up a significant number of pensions that were being paid to deceased persons. Each year, each exercise since has only picked up anything that happened in the previous two years. So that uh, did fall. Um, of the, out of the last exercise where the, the value of the outcomes was 16.8 million, um, only 3 million this time was housing benefit, which is the lowest in relation to housing benefit. But um, a relatively new type of match, the uh, council tax uh, single person discounts, um, that accounted for 5.6 million. And that was this time round the largest. So as NFI has developed, it's looked at different uh, aspects of fraud and the uh, relative uh, proportion from each type has changed and I suspect will continue to change. For example, when the new social security powers are uh, finally enacted in Scotland, I would expect those uh, payment streams to come within NFI and that may well form a new um, fruitful area. Right. So, so the nature of the problem is obviously changing over time. If you look at housing benefit, though, I mean, obviously what you're suggesting is that housing benefit now has been going down. It's now down to £3 million in the latest figures. Is that right? Yeah. How, how does that compare in the earlier years, do you know, with housing benefit? Off, offhand, not certain, but I would have said at least double that. Right, right, OK. So if you take housing benefit as the example, um, in terms of the deterrent effect, now I fully understand having uh, done a lot of evaluation stuff myself in a previous life, the difficulty of trying to even guesstimate, let alone estimate um, the, the deterrent impact of these schemes. But two points. First of all, is it not time to maybe look at the deterrent impact? Uh, for example, um, I mean, a proxy for deterrent impact might be the number of repeat offenders. So if the number of repeat offenders is going down, that would suggest, by proxy, that the deterrent effect was operating and effective. Um, so do you have any evidence at all? I, I realise, you know, it's difficult to, to be precise about these things, but do you have any evidence at all about the deterrent effect? I, I, I don't think we do in Scotland, but I don't know whether any of my colleagues do. No, I mean, I, what I would add is, is each NFI exercise is, is taken as a standalone exercise, and that, that certainly the legislation powers that we have and the code that we the work around require us pretty much to start again for each exercise. So we are able to take, as, as they, they alluded in the previous session, we are able to take previous comments. And so if a match generates again, because that person is still in receipt of benefits, say, for example, and still working, we're able to show them that the outcome of their investigation last time. But because of the, the restrictions around what we can, can't keep, we don't have that sort of intelligence over time about... But you can't tell who's a repeat offender? No. I is mean, that, we, is we, that not a loophole in the law? Um, it may be. It may be something that you, that you want to consider. I mean, we look at um, known fraud... Um, data intelligence from other areas. So we use Amber Hill, which is around stolen and fraudulent identities. And we're just doing some pilot work with CIFAT, which is around known fraudsters in the private sector and looking to see whether that known fraud intelligence can add value. Uh, and the cabinet office is also looking in England about um, sharing known fraud intelligence across utilities, um, technological mobile sector, local authorities and private banking sector. So there is work going on looking at whether yeah. we, we should be expanding that. Can I say, I remember two or three years ago when I was Housing Minister I'm visiting Edinburgh City Council and they did an exercise uh, looking at the private rented sector and comparing people who had registered as private rented 
owners of private rented property. And actually, that exercise, I remember them telling me, it uncovered a lot of social security and housing benefit fraud. And a lot of these, well, not a lot, but a percentage of the uh, people who owned the private rented houses were involved with the tenants in the fraud in many cases. So that kind of exercise, is that being repeated across Scotland and across the country? I don't know the extent to which that is being repeated uh, across Scotland, but as, as you heard from uh, one of the uh, earlier panel, recovery of council housing stock has been one of the um, more recent uh, successes of, 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 of NFI. Um, and some of those, I am, I am aware, did link through into the private sector, whether it was private uh, rented in the same area, I'm not sure. Right. So is there a way, I mean, each, we've got 32 local authorities in Scotland, so if the likes of Edinburgh has got a proven track record and very effectively using its PRS registration system to uncover fraud, that's not the primary purpose of their exercise, but it, it was one of the uh, silver linings of it. Um, with that good practice in Edinburgh, is there a way of spreading that across all 32 authorities, for example? There certainly should be, because there are numerous forums of local authority um, practitioners in various in various areas, in, including internal audit, including the fraud prevention teams as well. So um, there certainly should be. So uh, the Scottish Executive, are you not benchmarking um, performance in this between each of the 32 authorities? I mean, for example, if Edinburgh is is doing that very effectively um, that should presumably show up in the stats um, so you're not looking at how then you can proactively spread good practice throughout the system that's something that audit scotland does try and do when we're when we become aware of good practice i don't think that's an area that we have looked at in recent years you not be looking at it perhaps we should i will take that I mean, back there to could my be colleagues quite a return on that for example can I just finalise, finally ask, a, picking up a point that was raised by one of the ladies from Midlothian in the panel, um, when she said she thought if the National Fraud Initiative was better advertised and there was more awareness of the existence and indeed the effectiveness of the National Fraud Initiative, that the deterrent effect could probably be substantially enhanced. Uh, do you not think it's worthwhile maybe picking up that suggestion, looking at different ways of advertising it and targeting that advertising to potential, um, you know, there must be a profile of people who are most likely to, to offend, there usually is, um, but is it is it not a suggestion worthwhile looking at to see, even piloting to see if that's effective? I certainly think it's it's worth it's worth considering because yeah, we do encourage councils to publicise the exercise both before it takes place, as some of the previous panel referred to, and in particular when they have successes to um, get them into the local press. For example, um, we publish the. Uh, report on each exercise. We've brought it to this committee and its predecessors, um, partly deliberately to raise its profile um, in some of the earlier exercises. So as you need to advertise it <laughs> for people listen. In some of the previous exercises, <laughs> we have also managed to get um, interest from broadcast media. So we, we have appeared on... Um, the various yeah. news programmes. Yeah, as but well. that's that's obviously an opportunistic approach. Is there not need for a more proactive, comprehensive, uh, targeted, focused advertising strategy, at least to, to pilot it to see uh, if that has an impact on on the figures? It's certainly worth considering. Yes. Yeah. So is that something you'll take up then? We will look at it. Yes. Right. Good. Thank you. Colin BC. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Broadly, I'll stick to the same questions I asked the previous panel, but first I'd like to ask uh, Russell Frith a particular question. Um, previously giving oral evidence, uh, I asked you about uh, whether there was any penalties for, uh, for bodies that, uh, that don't participate or whatever, and you said 
and I quote, no, not in the legislation. But in your written submission, Audit Scotland says, the legislation already mandates participation and provides for fines on conviction for bodies that do not provide information. Were we talking about two different things? No, we were not. I had, I had forgotten about the provision in the legislation, which is indeed there. Um, but as I think I emphasised in the previous uh, answer and indeed in the written uh, submission, um, our philosophy has been to try and encourage participation because we think that the better outcomes will occur from willing and active participation. And it's not, as, as some of the previous panel also said, it's not just the provision of data that makes the exercises effective, it's how you follow through on those matches. And yes, there is a, a, a mandation in the legislation for bodies to provide data, but not a mandation to use it effectively. Okay. Coming back to what I spoke to the other panel about, I was interested in this real-time pre-transaction checking. Does anybody actually do this? I, I can answer that, um, and then possibly colleagues from Wales might want to come in. Yes, it's a simple answer. So it's it's not a mandatory um, initiative. It's a piece of work that we've launched alongside the, the NFI batch product. So it allows the same checks to be done in real time. So the point, as, as you talked about in the previous session, is around at the point somebody puts an application in, the NFI is able to check against the data it already holds and to provide the information back on that individual. Um, so that's able to, to identify potentially fraudulent applications. It's also able to identify those that are consistent with the information we have. So in effect, um, risk score applications. So we talked a lot earlier about resources. I mean, I suppose one of the key points here is it allows those resources to be better targeted rather than saying you need a lot more resources to do lots more checks. It's about saying you can use this as one of the ways of risk scoring applications and then you can check the more potentially uh, those that seem to indicate they're more likely to be fraudulent. Um, so it's it's a service that's rolled out. Um, around 50, 60 local authorities and other participants are using it across the UK. Um, I'll bring colleagues from Wales in, if I may, just to talk about. Um, just picking up on one of the things that Darren said earlier, he referred to the two yearly exercise as being the main NFI exercise. And to a certain extent, I had to take issue with that. Um, I think the two yearly exercise produces a number of matches, and investigating those matches is very resource intensive. It would be far, far better, and I think the way we would like to go is to move towards, is to move towards picking up frauds before they actually occur. If we can pick them up before they occur, they're not in the system, there's no recovery action actually needed, there's no detailed investigations needed. And this is what the new tool that's been introduced in the last 18 months to two years is designed to actually do. For public bodies who are giving grants, giving application, uh, giving benefits, giving services out, to be able to check real time to see whether there are anomalies which could be due to fraud, and as a result, not give those awards if they can avoid doing it. Is it an expensive service? In, in Wales, the decision was actually made by the Auditor General to provide the service to all NFI participants, and that is actually funded through the, the Welsh Consolidated Fund. So all, all NFI, NFI participants have access to the service. The extent to which it's being used in Wales is, is variable. What, what we'd like to see is public bodies building it into their system controls. So it's not a counter-fraud tool as such. It's simply a process they go, go through when deciding whether to grant an application. Um, they don't maybe think of it as a counter-fraud tool. What we're finding is some of our, our participants are using the tool for certain services, not for other services. And it's, a, it, it's going to take time, I think, for it to fully embed. But over time, I, I do think probably that service should become the main NFI exercise. If it's working effectively, it should also reduce dramatically the number of matches in the two yearly exercise. I have to say that uh, having listened to the previous panel, they didn't seem to be terribly enthusiastic. I mean, 
I think um, it, going back to the cost point, um, it costs. There's either a pay-as-you-go service, which works out around about a pound a check, or for a local authority, they can pay eighteen hundred and fifty pounds for a year, and then do as many checks as they they wish. Um, I think I think maybe the difference is it, in England the cabinet office um, recharge local authorities directly for their NFI participation. Um, so local authorities in England are are used to paying for the NFI anyway. So the fact that they now pay for an additional service isn't an alien concept to them. I think in Scotland it's it's funded differently, and the main exercise is part of the audit fee. So then the fact that there is a fee to pay for NFI for the application checking service maybe isn't what they're used to. So that might be where some of that. The other thing I was asking about was the question of housing associations and alios, and uh, clearly there should be a, a great benefit in bringing housing associations into the into the NFI scheme. Do we have do we have uh, experience of this elsewhere, and has it actually shown greater results in incorporating housing associations? Um, certainly, um, in England, we're very similar to Scotland in terms of we don't get much participation, much engagement with housing associations. We do get some around the edges, and we've had some good cases where housing associations have discovered and recovered lots of properties. Um, we also have cases where local authorities will incentivise the housing associations to come on board and will work with them. So they may say, put your data in and we'll help you follow up the matches because it's in our interest. So there's sort of collaborative um, approach. But in the main, the vast majority of the housing association stock isn't included in the NFI. And obviously that, that starts to impact on the effectiveness to which you can target social housing fraud. I mean, clearly it's a big gap. Is there any intention uh, to uh, make it mandatory for housing associations and perhaps alios? Um, in, in England, <laughs> we've committed to working with housing associations and the wider local authority arena to understand how we can better target NFI to help them. Um, and for example, we just talked about the application checking service. We've got an example of one authority in London that's recovered 10 properties or prevented 10 applications going through. Um, so it may be the solution it better sits with a sort of a real time service for them. So it's at the minute we're in collaboration with them to understand how we can better develop the product to, to allow them to effectively target their fraud risk. Have experience. I wonder whether I could bring in Mr. Gray at this point. Does have experience. Um, we have brought in, on a voluntary basis, the two largest housing associations. So that gives us uh, uh, the majority of all the social housing in Northern Ireland is now encapsulated within the NFI. We did it for the first time uh, in the, the last run. We haven't, as yet, identified huge outcomes from that. What it has shown up, though, is a number of data quality issues in the data that's held by housing associations. So when they've addressed those, their data will be a lot more valuable to the NFI. And I would expect them to start seeing some outcomes from that. Any experience of this in Wales? Similarly, in Wales, uh, housing associations are not mandatory participants. Uh, we have uh, a couple of housing associations that participate on a voluntary basis, um, but the Auditor General has made representations to the National Assembly for Wales <coughs> around um, introducing or amending legislation to increase the mandatory participants to include, for example, housing associations and others. So I suppose, that just to finish this off, um, the, the question in my mind is, would you make it mandatory? Or are you content to continue with voluntary arrangements? Because I'm not clear what you're saying to us. Cer Mr. Gray. Oh, sorry. sorry. Mr. Say, sorry Mr. Mr. Um, certainly, certainly from our point of view, um, if, if they're mandatory participants, uh, it's going to make it much more straightforward. Um, okay. Obviously, there's clearly issues with, with data and data quality that have to be overcome in the first couple of years. But once that's there, once the data sets in, um, it's much easier than to uh, to operate on a voluntary basis. And our experience of voluntary basis, despite the fact it doesn't cost them anything in terms of a fee, um, and despite the um, kind of um, awareness raising we've done, um, we haven't been as successful as we would like in encouraging voluntary participation. Okay. Is that a view that's shared? Yes. 
As Thank a traditional you. public auditor, I'm very keen on following the money. So where bodies are in receipt of public money, I think it's it's incumbent okay. upon them to participate in these things. It's good public policy. Okay, Mr. Rees? I think in terms of the legislation itself, simply because um, organisations can be mandated to participate, it doesn't mean that they it doesn't mean that they have to be asked to participate. And I think that's an important distinction. Okay. Because, for example, some housing associations are very, very small, sure. and the question of proportionality comes into it. Okay, that's a helpful point to make. Um, Willie Coffey. I could ask you the, a similar question to ask the previous panel. Um, where, where a fraud is perhaps established in, say, year one, and there's potential for that fraud to be attempted in, say, year two, three, four, five, why wouldn't that data be be part of the, the data set for consideration in years two, three, four, five, you know, to try to stamp out any attempted repeat frauds by a person? I can talk more generally. I suppose one of, one of the areas we've looked at as we've started to look at the value of this known fraudster intelligence, and as I've alluded to earlier, we're looking at Amber Hill, which is sort of um, stolen fraudulent identities, and we're just now working with CIFAS, which is a database of sort of known fraudsters in the private sector who've committed fraud against the banking and financial sectors, and we're looking to see if there is any value. Um, there's also been discussion around the creation of that sort of known fraudster database, but as yet I'm unaware of a, a known fraudster database that anybody retains that would be um, accessible on something that you could bring into NFI. But as I say, Cabinet Office is looking and working with others around a wider sort of um, known fraudster intelligence sharing service. <laughs> so I think that is something that's being looked at and considered, but at this stage I'm not aware of a of a sort of if you like, a benefit frauds to database that we could take and cross match. But is it, I mean, if there is an outcome that identifies a person as having committed a fraud and so on, is that not recorded back in the data somehow that that was a positive match and it led to a, a conviction or whatever? It is, is, that, is that not fed back into the system so that there's kind of red flag possibility there for the next year for that same person? So we, we capture information, um, as you allude, as uh, so a case management system, so the, the participants are able to record on the system. Um, so they are able to record the outcomes and the status, so they can, they can classify a case as fraud or error, um, and they can tick prosecution or not. Um, generally, you don't know whether it's a successful prosecution, and a lot of the time, the, the fraud definition is dependent on how they've defined fraud locally. I mean, we give guidance around what you define as fraud and sort of balance of probability, et cetera, but it is around local interpretation and how they want to record that. So I would, I would suggest we have considered whether we could start to take that information and utilise it, but there are lots of challenges there around what's going into that data part, uh, the robustness of it, and then data subject notifications, you'd need to then notify the individuals that they've then been put on that database and then you'd need the right of appeal. So I think there is a, there is a process that you could you could explore. It's not quite as simple, I don't, I don't personally think, as saying, right, we're going to capture that and we're going to utilise it. The data are part then, we heard from the local authority colleagues that they, they don't systematically do this, they don't follow up on potential repeat offenders, but is there anything stopping them actually doing it, given that they know that they've, they've had a successful case, for example, that are, are they required only to operate with the data set that they're presented with? I mean, it seems ridiculous that if, if they know that people are trying to perpetrate and commit certain frauds and have done so, that they would then ignore those people in subsequent years. Are they able to do that from your understanding of the legislation? I mean, I suppose from my perspective, um, if it is... Uh, a determined fraudster who's out to, 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 to f commit fraud, they're not necessarily likely to use the same details next time, so they start, they're likely to start changing their identity or factors of the application, so it's not going to be Joe Bloggs exactly matching to the previous time. So I think from my perspective, probably the, the better way that, to utilise it, and again, they talked about this in the first session, is to look at how those frauds were perpetrated look at where the internal controls maybe could be strengthened to stop similar um, incidents going through the system in future. Because, say, if it is a determined fraudster, they're not necessarily likely to use the same details. And, uh, Russell, in your paper, uh, you, mentioned, and you, you mentioned it in comments 
earlier about the council tax single person discount assuming there was 4,846 of them in whatever particular year. What's to stop those people trying it again in <laughs> second year and third year? There's nothing to stop them trying but it the, again, the but they, if they do, one. they will be caught on the next exercise But only again. for in the data set that's presented in the second year. I mean, if they yes. Have, you know, so yeah, through, through the NFI, yes. Yeah, um, the NFI scheme. They might not appear in the second but, but, data set for, for year two or year three. Well, they, 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 they should do so if they're... Yeah. If, if they're still doing the same thing, they will they will okay. ap they will appear again because they will still be matching to the electoral roll to claiming the single person uh, discount. But okay. one thing I, sh I should say, I think, is that NFI we believe is a valuable exercise, but it is only one part of a council or any other body's um, fraud uh, prevention and detection arrangements. Um, you know, as one of the previous panel alluded to, internal control is their first line of, mm. of, of, of defence. Mm. I could, I could ask a question about the, the role of HMRC as well. You've heard several colleagues talking about the benefits of potentially bringing HMRC within the scope of the NFI. Uh, and uh, one, of, one, of, one of the colleagues said, we don't have a legal channel, I think he said, to to require or request information. Is that is that the case? Could, it, could it HMRC voluntarily give this data on request or would they require to be brought within the scope of the, the NFI scheme? Certainly, certainly the NFI, um, data, well, the data matching powers in England, um, same in the other, the other parts, do allow voluntary participation. Um, there have certainly been barriers around sharing government data and certainly there have been particular um, restrictions on government departments which have prevented on certain occasions and there has been a digital economy bill that's just gone through um, parliament and part of the remit of that is to look at data sharing to enhance and to to, to facilitate better data sharing so um, i suspect, suspect you'd need to look at the particular cases and the particular hmrc data that you wanted to target but i think you know those gateways are opening if they're not already open and i would also as the previous session did allude to the fact that there is already data sharing between the dwp hmrc around real-time income which is cross-matched to the housing benefits so the local authorities are getting through for the housing benefit element only are getting that information cross-matched and getting those referrals that relate to them and similarly the dwp are getting the relevant referrals from that intelligence um yes there would be um benefits in bringing that into nfi um but but one of the key benefits would have been housing benefits and as i say that's been done through this different initiative so it's just about making sure we join up those initiatives and and understand where the additional benefits lie we heard colleagues saying that they hadn't asked HMRC on a number of occasions. They just hadn't asked. What I'm trying to find out is, had they asked, would they have been given the data? Or, or is it, does it only come about as a requirement to be part of the legislative framework to hand over the data? From, from my experience outside NFI, I'm aware of some local authorities um, interacting with HMRC, but I'm aware also of difference of opinion about what they can and can't get. So I, I, would, I wouldn't say there is, you know, there's a one standard approach that try this, but I, there are examples of it working. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. Thank you. I wonder whether I could just follow this up. So, you know, is it your considered view across um, all four areas that, that actually HMRC data should be able to be accessed? Yes or no? I mean, it's as simple as that. Just so that we have clarity from you, Mr. Gray. It would be of tremendous value in one in preventing and detecting fraud, which is obviously what the NFI is all about. But potentially, it does offer other opportunities for data matching. Okay. Um, if, for example, uh, we had access to income data, yeah. we could, for example by matching that against social security data, we could identify client individuals um, and groups of folk who perhaps weren't claiming all the benefits they were entitled to. That's certainly been a, a proposition that's come to me from members of our assembly. Um, so this isn't just about preventing and detecting fraud. There, there's a wider social benefit to this. Okay, thank you very much.
Mr Frith. Yes, I entirely agree. Okay. Um, access to full HMRC data would um, significantly increase okay. the benefit of the exercise. And Mr Barrett. Uh, yes, we also agree it would be very be beneficial. I like unanimity of opinion. OK, I have, I think, one final question from Monica Lennon. Thank you, Kimbina. Um In the last uh, panel um, session, I raised the issue um, about not using the software updates, perhaps not responding promptly to other organisations. So um, we're getting at some of the, the resource and capacity issues. But I wonder, um, I see that the source of, of, of these concerns is indeed from the Cabinet Office NFI team. So Mr Shillington, I wonder, um, it's in the it's Appendix 3 of the, the Audit Scotland report, if, if you have it in front of you. I wonder um, if, if these concerns and patterns that you've identified um, relate to capacity and resources or is it more about um, skills and, and, and sort of lack of um, training perhaps in, in some of the teams? I think it's Both. Um, so I, I think um, some organisations have the best of intent and don't necessarily use the tool as effectively as they can to target the work that they do. Um, and I think others, um, some don't have the capacity, so that it's about targeting that capacity. I mean, I think there are examples also of some just don't have the intent to, to follow up the matches. So I think it's it's across the spectrum. Um, but I think, as I alluded to earlier, I mean, what, what we're looking to do is provide the tool and the technology to allow the, those participants to target their action, target their resources at those cases that meet their investigative um, um, requirements. So the tool allows them to prioritise and to use the tool to, to identify those that meet their criteria for investigation. Um, I think a lack of awareness and lack of training sometimes means they're not aware of that. Um, but um, we certainly don't expect organisations to follow up every match. That's never been the intention. So it's about using the tool effectively. Um, what I would say is from a sort of central coordination angle, we do have um, management information that we're looking at and if we can spot poor practice we will try and stop that so if we can see ineffective use of the the tool um we will um, intervene and try and encourage organizations to use it more effectively okay well, that's helpful so that kind of intervention um is that just hoping that people there'll be a bit of goodwill that they'll respond to that appropriately you can't i suppose compel people to to use the software in a certain way or no, we can't. I mean, obviously, we can encourage them where we don't feel they're using it effectively to, to maximise the benefits, and equally where we think they're using it ineffectively and that their resources could be better targeted, we will try and support them. So we will support them through that process. Um, certainly now now we're part of the Cabinet Office. When we're part of the Audit Commission, we have those audit avenues that you talked about in the previous session open. Mm -hmm. We don't have those. I think Mr Barrett wanted to add something. Yeah, if I could just uh, add something from, from our experience in Wales. Um, organizations that are mandatory participants are required to provide the data sets they're not there's nothing mandatory about what happens with the matches um, the only sanction available to us is is ultimately is publicity and um, we have said in the past to an organization who wasn't um, investigating matches we will name you in our annual report as the only organization in wales who has not investigated any matches now that spurred them on uh, into looking at some of the matches and finding matches and recovering information. Um, but that kind of, for want of a better phrase, naming and shaming is probably the only sanction available to us in terms of um, persuading them to participate, other than um, us talking and sitting down with them, working through uh, various things about how they could uh, further prioritise the matches. Thank you. Okay. Okay, in the absence of um, other questions from members, I have one <coughs> last thing just to clarify with Mr Frith, if I might. Um, you mentioned both in your submission and in oral evidence about the issue of electoral roll data, um, and there appear to be different legal views as to whether electoral law allows electronic copies of the register to be provided for data matching purposes. Um, would, you, would it be helpful if the committee clarified the extent of the power with the Cabinet Secretary when we have him before us? It would be very useful to have, okay. have his views, yes. OK, so you, you don't think you currently have that power? Um, we, we think the power it could be read into the legislation. A couple of authorities have 
come to a different view. Uh, if my understanding is right about England, I think every local authority provides the, okay. uh, yeah. the equivalent data. Um, in relation to those uh, electoral rolls, they are used mainly in relation to the single person discounts. Mm -hmm. And we do accept that NFI is not the only way in which you can obtain that uh, information. For example, if a council employs a data, uh, a credit reference agency, they can get um, other data sets that way, which can also help them to identify uh, errors in that in, in, in uh, single person discounts. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, can I thank all of the witnesses, particularly those that, that are far travelled, for coming the, this morning. Um, if there is any matters of detail that we wish to pursue with you, we will write to you. Once we've had an opportunity to reflect on the first panel's evidence, we may come back to you with questions. Um, and the committee will note that we have the um, Scottish Government coming to give evidence on FA, NFI on the 15th of June. Um, so can I thank our witnesses and move us on to um, item two, but before I do so, I'll suspend the meeting briefly to allow you to move away from the table. Thank you very much. Conscious of time, so I'm just going to move to agenda item two very quickly. Um, the committee has uh, a note of all the major capital projects' progress. That's an update from the Scottish Government, um, which we considered. Uh, it's for March 2017. Um, the covering paper by the clerks highlights four suggestions um, for inclusion in future updates, um, and I think these suggestions came from the Auditor General. Um, do members agree to ask the Scottish Government to progress these? Yes. Okay, great. I wonder whether I could also suggest that we ask for some additional information. Um, things like economic impact, the jobs generated during the construction phase, because I think there is a good story to tell with the amount of investment that, that there is through procurement. And for those that are revenue projects, because we've been given capital costs, but a number of these are revenue projects. So there is a net, um, I think, present value, it's called, NPV, um, which is different to the capital cost. So actually getting both those figures allows us to understand what the true cost is. So I think that would be useful. Um, I am conscious that there may be other committees interested in this, and members have, have pointed this out previously. Can I suggest we share this information with other committees, as is the practice of the clerks? And if people are happy with that, the only thing left to consider is whether we would like to take oral evidence in September. Can I make a suggestion that it, we wait and see what information we get back in and then make a judgment, um, hopefully before um, you know, September starts, as to whether that would be a helpful thing to do? Is that agreed by the committee? Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. On that basis, um, there is no meeting next week for some strange reason. Um, and so I close this meeting and I look forward to seeing you all in a fortnight's time. <laughs>